Tēnā koto nā mi nui ki a koto katoa. E nā manuhiri, matararahi, e nā hoamahi, e nā toera, e nā kaitotoko, me nā hoa. Nō mai, haere mai ki te whare wānanga. A very warm welcome to family and friends, distinguished guests, academic and professional colleagues, students and our wider community to the inaugural lecture of Professor of Human Resource Management, Jane Bryson. I'm Jennifer Windsor, Acting Vice-Chancellor, and it is actually really good. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you here this evening. I'm really pleased to be joined by Chancellor John Allen, uh, by other colleagues from Council, from colleagues from the senior leadership team, and from around the university. I think if you looked around this room, this would be one of the most diverse audiences for an inaugural from all parts of the community. And I think that speaks a great deal to Professor Bryson's impact. I think that all inaugurals are moments of celebration and to hear about the significant research and scholarship of our professors. And for me, it's a particular pleasure tonight to also acknowledge Professor Bryson's scholarship in the wider context of her role as Dean of the Wellington School of Business and Government, as well as having previously been Acting Pro Vice Chancellor. Jane happens to be a globally recognized expert in human resource management. She joined our university in 1999 bringing with her extensive international experience as a human resources manager, organizational psychologist, and management consultant. During her academic career, she's also been Associate Dean of Research, as well as Deputy Dean. And perhaps related to her area of scholarship, she has shown, ex shown exceptional management and leadership. Jane is highly regarded across the university for her judicious, her pragmatic, her assured, and her very human approach to leadership. She was named a professor in 2021. Jane's research focuses on achieving human capability through work. I think her scholarship is quite remarkable in its breadth, spanning as it does several work sectors, and just as a few examples of her overall body of work, Jane's raised issues about the questionable value of a policy focus on individual work skills. She's introduced new conceptual models for analyzing cultural change and the dynamics of organizational change. She's looked at the role of the collective voice of trade unions as a mechanism for worker participation. She's examined employee resilience and managing growth during challenging times. Now, these are all issues at the very contemporary heart of how we work and how we live. Her work is highly influential, and she is a preeminent point of contact for employers and HR professionals, for government working parties, and for ministerial advisory committees, and an expert witness, as well as being a preeminent point of contact within our academic communities. It's no question her work is hugely impactful. And I would argue that her work has real impact and meaning, not only because it lies at the intersection of theory, methods, and practice, it's also because her overall body of work drives us to ask quite challenging questions about how we work and about how we live. And tonight, Jane will explore issues related to how to facilitate the development of human capability and the value of multiple perspectives in human resource management. Elsewhere, Jane has been quoted as saying this, workers aspire to live lives they have reason to value, and that human contributions to society are not wholly through work, and organizational contributions to society are not wholly economic. And if you've noticed in her very cheeky invitation to her inaugural, you'll have seen the presentation subtitle, Autonomous Skilled Individuals or Compliant Clog? Ah, cog, not clog. <laughs> <laughs> Although it could be both, we don't know until we hear the inaugural. <laughs> Autonomous Skilled Individuals or Compliant Cog in a Machine. And I think with those kinds of provocation, 
I think we're in for a real treat tonight from a highly accomplished scholar. Kia ora rau atu Jane, thank you. Many congratulations on your professorship. Would everyone please help me welcome Professor Jane Bryson. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. You, me, the Uber driver, the asparagus picker, the shop assistant, the doctor, the cleaner, the farmer, the entrepreneur, the union official, the MP, the policy advisor, the musician, we are all people at work, paid, unpaid, full-time, part-time. How do we get our work? Thinking historically, we might have been born to a station in life or followed the footsteps of our family or tribe. But more likely, we would have been enslaved as a result of conquest or capture. We could have turned up at a rural hiring fair established in the 14th century to combat labour shortages after the plague. Maybe we'll have to have them again. <laughs> We might have been bought off by the king's shilling, pressed ganged into service at sea. In more recent centuries, we might have gone seagulling daily on the wharves, been conscripted or rostered by a temp agency, subcontracted by someone else, shoulder tapped by someone we knew, illegally trafficked, headhunted. We might have responded to a job advertisement or were we selected by an algorithm? Are we slaves, servants, freemen, masters, employers, employees, contractors, temps, volunteers, peace workers, gig workers? What are we at work? Our status and our opportunities and freedoms are influenced by how society has chosen to organise itself both formally and informally, through democratic political processes or through political coercion or diktat, we structure our economic systems and institutions, determining how we create and distribute resources amongst us all. Our legislative and regulatory systems, systems of social control, set in place the societal playing field in which we live our lives. These social arrangements matter. They have influence on our fates. They frame us as people in life and at work. Enfranchised or marginalised, colonised or empowered, valued or not. But experts in sociology, political economy, history, classics, anthropology, law, Take your pick of great people across this entire university and in this room. Could weave this expla explanation with more precision than I. What leads a human resource management academic educated in psychology to be concerned with such things? Well, the answer to that lies in two areas. First, in the academic field, of HRM, human resource management, and the counterbalancing field of industrial relations, or in modern parlance, employment relations. Second, and at the risk of sounding self-referential and it's all about me, um, it lies in my journey of learning and discovery, my academic perambulations or meanderings, if you like, and the people that have surrounded me through that process. Farnau, colleagues, students, research participants, external influences. So over the next 40 minutes, brace yourselves, I will take us on a tour which reflects some of my research and my concern with how we view people at work, the embedded assumptions, the questions we do and don't ask. But first, uh, some thanks and the beginning of my journey. My 
formal education was in organisational psychology originally, a discipline which concerns itself with human behaviour at work. I came to an academic career late, um, after 15 years working in the public and private sectors in HRM and in consulting roles. I consider it a privilege to be an academic, to explore and to influence through research and teaching, and in turn to be challenged and influenced by academic colleagues and students, by research participants, and by the practitioners I hope to inform in some small way. I owe thanks to many, many people along the way. I can't possibly thank them all tonight. But not least, my three siblings and my late parents, Bill and Jean Bryson. All of them intelligent, liberal-minded, caring, supportive people. And as the baby of the family, I benefited from all five educating and challenging me. Spoiling, some might say. My husband, Professor Gordon Anderson, who gives me not only his legal perspective on employers and workers, but also his pragmatic reminder of the difference between law and justice, particularly for workers. Ironically, for a legal academic, he has also taught me the power of a short sentence in making your point. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon for that and for so much more. To Professor Sik Hong Ng, or NG as he has always been known, for his second year social psychology classes, and to Kerr Inkson, whose six guest lectures on organisational psychology in that second year at Otago in, dare I say it, 1980, totally captivated me and led me to complete my Master's in Organisational Psychology at the University of Canterbury. This was largely taught by the inspiring Bruce Jamison, a lecturer who drew the best out of students, until he then chose to become Director of HR at the University of Canterbury. <laughs> but ultimately, years later, great academic influence came from my two PhD supervisors, NG, by that time a professor here at Victoria, and Chris Parkin in philosophy, also at Victoria, and latterly at Otago Medical School, Wellington. Chris, I think, might be in the audience. I hope so. Yes. Great. Um, Chris, you introduced me to the vocabulary, the thinking, the questions and reasoning of generations of moral philosophers. In retrospect, this really awakened me to different disciplinary perspectives and framing of topics, so thank you. My PhD alerted me not only to the fascination of taking different disciplinary perspectives on a topic, but also to the impact of different framing by individuals within an organisation. In my PhD, I used psychology and moral philosophy to explore the ethics of managers and doctors in New Zealand public hospitals. A question I asked at the beginning of interviews with doctors and with managers about their perception of their respective roles revealed some important differences in their perspectives. This was sort of a side finding to my questions on ethics. Managers felt <coughs> Doctors enacted their roles as independent professionals. Doctors felt their roles were framed as technically skilled employees. Doctors saw managers' roles as organisation-focused gatekeepers. While managers saw their roles as gatekeepers, they also saw themselves as facilitators of work and patient care. It's hard working in a humanitarian but resource-constrained organisation such as a hospital or health board. But the generally unvoiced differences in mutual role perceptions or framing and what they thought the roles should be led to misunderstanding and underpinned a myriad of unspoken tensions. Some years later, I came across this on-the-ground difference in framing of people at work with a business owner. I interviewed him during the uh, Building Our Productivity research, 
with colleagues, professors of management, Sally Davenport and Urs Dallenbach, marketing academic Michelle Renton, and communications expert Professor Shirley Leach. Thank you to all of you, by the way. This very successful founder of a food product business, hence my picture, uh, growing, picking, packing, adding value to product, told me when I asked to speak with the organization's human resource manager that he didn't have one, saying, if you get an HR manager, then you get HR problems, and I don't want any of those. This was a successful company. It had low staff turnover, a seemingly good employer deeply embedded in the local community. Of course, he did have issues with workers, but he didn't frame them as HR issues. They were framed as business, production, or community issues. For instance, employing workers seasonally created a business headache with limited labour supply in a provincial town when the dole became a more attractive prospect for predictable income than erratic seasonal employment income. So the owner thought about the life circumstances and needs of the potential labour pool. After all, they were his next door neighbours. He saw them at the pub. He then tailored the work terms and conditions to meet their needs. Specifically, in work that could not be done when it was raining or all year round, he had provided continuity of income through a weekly base level of pay, regardless of weather. This is what he told me. You have to understand, Jane, what are these people doing? How do they survive in the world? You've got to understand that these people have got mortgages or rent to pay on their house, higher purchase payments on their television or whatever. They have to make enough money to do that. If because of the weather you haven't got any work for a week, what's that person going to do? So we've guaranteed a minimum income. He had framed his workers as people with lives and needs. He had framed the employment relationship as one of mutual benefit to the organisation and to the worker. He implemented pay and other support actions accordingly. This gave them a loyal workforce and reduced the need to constantly recruit and train up new staff. It also, of course, increased the social legitimacy of the organisation in the local community. It was seen as a good employer. I revisited the website of that organisation last week, just out of interest. I didn't want to present an example that had gone down the tubes. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, over a decade later, it is clear that the strong values base of the owner still pervades the framing of the worker in the culture of that organisation. Management of people at work happens through line managers and supervisors, but it is influenced by human resource management policies and systems and the HR advice and support from the HRM group, if there is one. In smaller businesses, in the absence of HR practitioners, often the beliefs and practices of the employer, sometimes well-meaning and sometimes not, replace any formalised policy. The way in which people are treated at work is a product of how they are framed or perceived by the organisation or employer. How they are treated by managers, but also by the employer's HRM policies, processes, employment systems and strategy. These encapsulate the beliefs and values of the organisation. In my research on developing human capability, I've looked at influences on how we frame people at work as happening at three interconnected levels, institutional, organisational and individual. That institutional level is the regulatory system and signals created by government through the economic system, the education system, employment institutions, standards and protections. For example, if there were no minimum wage and no health and safety standards, how would that frame workers? probably as somewhat expendable and of no individual value. At the organisational level, the formal systems and processes of organisations, the business model, the business strategy, workplace practices, culture, all convey how workers are framed in that organisation. 
Workers might be seen as liabilities to be managed, cogs in a machine, or trusted partners in the organisation. And at the individual level, the individual brings competence, confidence, agency, aspirations in varying amounts. How might a person frame or value themselves and others in the workplace and in their lives? So human resource management operates very much at the organisational level. We make societal and institutional level choices about how we frame and value workers, and this shifts over time. Often catalyzed by a change of government, the changing shape of the economy, or being pushed by lobby groups. HRM as an academic field, and as a label of a set of organisational practices and a function, is itself a reflection of a set of shifts institutionally in the 1980s and 1990s, which I'll talk more about shortly. By and large, the central function of HRM is to assist the organisation to achieve its goals through having an appropriately skilled, rewarded and managed workforce performing as required by management. The framing of people at work is conveyed by the label human resource management. Like plant and raw materials, humans are another resource to be managed and input to a production or service process. In some cases, the humans are perceived as interchangeable and expendable, and in other cases, their skills, knowledge and aptitudes are rare and provide the employee and employer some competitive advantage. Human resource management emerged as a US-inspired field of academic inquiry in the 1980s. If I were being glib, I would say it is the love child of strategic management and psychology, fueled by corporate America and peddled globally by large consulting companies. I know because I used to work for one. <laughs> this, blended, this blend valued inquiry into shaping worker behaviour to serve organisational goals. Within universities, industrial relations academics, generally people from a tradition of sociology, political economy, and labour economics, had to reinvent themselves to at least wear the veneer of HRM or ultimately recast themselves in employment relations. Because in the 1990s, many industrial relations academic departments disappeared in the UK and English-speaking nations a reflection of the swing towards more neoliberal economic policies, a framing of employment as an individual relationship, not a collective one, a view with no room for a counterbalancing collective voice or trade union representation that industrial relations championed. The difference between HRM and IR, industrial relations, and their framing of people at work is probably best explained with reference to a central paradigm in the IR and now employment relations field, the unitarist versus pluralist frames of reference model. Initially developed by British sociologist Alan Fox in the late 1960s. As colleagues at Otago, um, Alan Gear et al. observe, unitary and pluralist frames are more than style choices. They cut to the heart of how employers view perceive and approach the management of the employment relationship. Theoretically, at least, industrial relations and HRM have been portrayed as representing pluralist and unitarist ideology, respectively. The pluralist perspective acknowledges that there are differing interests in workplace relationships. Employees and employers may not agree. The likelihood of conflict and thus the need for the state to cater for that to be handled in a balanced manner for all concerned. For example, by having employment system regulation, employment institutions such as trade unions, tribunals and courts at the institutional level. The unitary perspective rests on an organisational logic of a unified authority and loyalty structure which legitimates managerial authority. So conflict is seen as unnecessary and that manager and worker interests are aligned. So workers should contribute to organisational goals under management direction. 
and managers deal directly with staff in order to inspire loyalty and build a unified culture. But let us return to the change in framing of people at work that heralded human resource management. I summarised the institutional and organisational shift behind HRM in New Zealand in a chapter published about five years ago. In this chapter, I argued that over the last 40 years, two major drivers have underpinned fundamental and ongoing change in the administration of workplace relationships in New Zealand. First, the neoliberal political economy agenda, which emerged in response to the oil shocks and other crises in the 1970s, catalyzed a range of consequential changes, from economic deregulation, labour market and state sector reform, all in the 80s and 90s, to the commoditization of employment, organisations and individuals in the 90s and 2000s. Government policies changed the ideology and approach to workplace relationships. In essence, it reframed people at work. Second, the revolutionary growth in information and communication technologies and their ever-expanding capabilities has enabled the pervasiveness of these changes. And this has been exacerbated over the last three years of pandemic-driven change. In New Zealand organisations, these two drivers established a shift from administering industrial awards to managing employer risk and organisational image. A core element of that shift was the reinvention of personnel management and industrial relations as human resource management and employment relations. Notionally, a move from a quasi-pluralist to a more unitary approach to workplace relationships. In the 1970s, those of you that can remember them, <laughs> the personnel department or staff section administered pay and rations according to national industrial awards. Hopefully a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Workers were a necessity to be administered. Trade union density was high in many industries and thus industrial ne negotiation was a feature of workplace relations. In New Zealand, the widespread change from that industrial relations to human resource management approach was led by the change to workplace management in the state sector as a result of the State Sector Act 1988. This coupled with the Employment Contracts Act 1991 paved the way, indeed encouraged, a more unitary approach to employment relationships. This change in institutional level framing of people at work was rapidly embedded in organisations through restructurings, new policies and practices, all supported by management consultants and their products and by US-inspired HR training and executive training. I recall this in the public sector in my first job. I joined the public sector in 1984 and overnight staff sections disappeared and HR departments emerged. HR has had an important role to play in managing risk for employers. Initially in the face of economic and labour market deregulation of the 80s and 90s, HR was focused on managing the financial risk of human capital costs. This entailed ensuring staff were employed on flexible arrangements favourable to the employer. For instance, with minimal or no redundancy provisions, or on fixed term contracts, or as independent contractors, or open-ended contracts without overtime. This focus on flexibility to manage costs has continued, and an added concern of managing legal liability and potential damage to organisational reputation has increased over the 90s and 2000s. This is due in part to legislative change and in part to improved mass communication technologies. In the decade to 2016, Labour flexibility grew with both temporal and geographical flexibility enabled by technology. The ability to work from home or any other location proved extremely useful in times of natural disaster, for example, after the Christchurch earthquake and Kaikoura earthquakes. Mobile technologies revolutionised some jobs, not only working at distance, but also instant ordering of products, access to important information, 
and rapid communication of information. And of course, now in 2022, that geographical flexibility is commonplace, driven by pandemic. However, it has also provided risks and challenges for HRM. How to ensure the extension of management control to those in different locations. Potential issues of health and safety of employees whom it's now possible to communicate with about work at any time of the day or night. This runs the risk of allowing no downtime, particularly for those in management or specialist roles, or problems of isolation and alienation. It also provides another medium through which miscommunication and conflict can occur. Now the world is a different place and so is New Zealand. Before the pandemic, work was already being transformed by information and communication technology. Indeed, it changes the type of work we do and how we do it. It changes how we relate to others and it blurs work and private life, space, time and information. It is now not enough to just do your job. Nowadays, the HR department on behalf of the CEO wants you to be a totally engaged employee, <laughs> loyal to the organisation and all your work and private life dealings, committed to exert discretionary effort for the organisation, willing to fulfil the sustainability or corporate social responsibility agenda of the organisation so as to boost its employer brand and social legitimacy. The HR department administer the terms and conditions of your employment agreement which were given to you as part of your individual um, employment agreement. Trade union density is low except in the public sector. The modern HR department is primarily concerned with managing risk for the employer. Workplace relationships are a liability to be managed. As a result, the emphasis is on HR policy and compliance, on employer reputation, organisational image and the workers' contribution to organisational goals. But spare, spare a thought for HR. The HRM role is riddled with tensions. Policy and compliance or tra transactional HR versus a capability and organisation development role and between business interests and work and wellbeing. One way or another, organisations have always framed workers somewhat instrumentally as a means to an end. The difference moving into the future is the predictable and unpredictable impact of information and communication technology on how we manage and relate to each other. Is this the beginning of another reframing of people at work? The most likely scenario is that workplace relationships and their management will continue along the now well-established path of HR implementing the unitary model focused on individualisation of the employment relationship, various forms of labour flexibility to meet the needs of the business, HR policy and advice to management and practices to ensure worker compliance and commitment. The concern for employer brand and organisational image will remain vital and integral to that will be a continuation of the move away from the term human resources to become not the HR director but chief people officers, director of people and capability or director of people and culture to name, to name a few. Whatever the title, the task is to serve the goals of the organisation. In the immediate future, the recent focus on well-being at work will continue. This well-being trend had its genesis partly at a much broader level in United Nations concerns with social well-being of the populace and attempts by various governments to incorporate measures of social well-being in national statistics. It is also one way in which HR responded to the New Zealand government's renewed interest in workplace health and safety. But well-being is not health and safety. However, it could be that translated to the workplace, it offers hope for a more pluralistic focus on the interests of workers rather than solely those of employer and shareholders. But as Koken notes, a US academic, to meet contemporary and future workplace challenges, HR professionals will need to define, redefine their role 
and professional identity to advocate and support a better balance between employer and employee interests at work. It seems from research that um, I have done that the vast majority of organisations only respond to actions which are perceived as either good for business or an unavoidable legal requirement. Notions of organisations having a wider responsibility to society, with a few notable exceptions, are few and far between. It is hardly surprising in this context that notions of HR adopting a wider framework encompassing responsibility for the social contract in the workplace are seldom raised. So, what are other ways of framing people at work? A large amount of my research has focused on exploring the development of human capability. Over several years, I used the capability approach of development economist Amartya Sen to frame a more expansive view of people at work. In this context, capability was not just about skills or achieving organisational goals, but about the opportunities, freedoms and agency afforded to people at work to live lives they have reason to value, that is, to be capable humans, not just skill sets for the workplace. However, not only at an organisational level, but also at an institutional level, our systems are not currently structured to achieve this. To frame people at work in this way, my research explored what expectations workers had of their work environment, the opportunities or freedoms they required. This is a very brief summary and I won't go into detail about it, but there's a lot more that lies behind it. But for workers, the opportunities or freedoms they wanted through the workplace fell into five broad areas. As you can see, security and safety, a number of things related to skill, not only developing it, but also the opportunity to use it. Um, relationships in the workplace, respect, uh, recognition in the form of pay and thanks for what is done, and autonomy, which also included the right to join um, collective groups, such as trade unions, um, to achieve work-life balance, to have some control over um, decision-making and how they approach their work. And on the other hand, employers reported they wanted competence, engagement and compliance. With some uh, employers, compliance just boiled down to wanting people to turn up to work on time. Um, so there is some alignment between skill and competence, um, but there's also some tension. And there's some tension between the desire for um, uh, uh, engagement versus the desire for safety and autonomy, uh, the desire for compliance versus the desire for autonomy. In one piece of work, I explored the skill side of the equation, and in particular, human resource development or training and development. I explored two important but seldom discussed questions. <clears throat> Is it reasonable to expect employers to contribute to human resource development? And what is it reasonable to expect? Research suggests that despite a changing human resource development vocabulary, for example, from training and development to learning and development, um, and an emphasis on lifelong learning, the practice of human resource development is almost exclusively concerned with the achievement of organisational ends and not about contributing to society or the wider workforce or the individual. This concern is underpinned by the pervasive assumption, assumptions of resource-based views of the firm and human capital theory, which assert, despite heavy criticism, that it is not reasonable to expect employers to act in the development interests of employees who may then leave the organisation or may not use all their skills for the benefit of the organisation. These theoretical frames have become unquestioned normative drivers of HRD. I've seen that when I've been interviewing employers um, who won't even take on apprentices 
would rather poach them once another employer has uh, invested in the apprenticeship training. I would argue that it is time to reorient HRD to human capability. The core tensions between the economic and the social and between organisational ends and individual needs with which HRM must, must grapple are epitomised in human resource development. Two requirements must be met to reframe practice. The first is that human resource development practitioners need to clarify their ethical underpinning by determining the answer to such questions as what are the action guiding principles that they adhere to? In whose interests do they practice? And what is the purpose and scope of their practice? The second requirement is that HRD practitioners need to explore a broader range of conceptions of human resource development practice and theoretical frameworks um, rather than the organisationally bound and largely short-term focused paradigms which have dom dominated thinking to date. SEN's capability approach to human development provides one framework within which to reorient HRD to the notion of developing human capability and permits the canvassing of a broader range of concerns in searching for the identity and ethical principles of human resource development practice. HRD practitioners could facilitate employers to reframe entrenched notions of training and development to create organisations as capability enhancing institutions. But achieving this may be problematical. I recently conducted research examining training clauses in collective employment agreements and interviewing a range of union officials representing a wide variety of industries and occupations. Training clauses in collective agreements tend to be narrow in scope, and the better clauses are for those occupations in which there are ongoing competency development requirements of the occupational body. In some organisations and in some sectors, there is a well-embedded culture of training, but not in all. Given access to training is so variable in New Zealand, with low-skilled occupations less likely to access employer-funded training and education, the training situation is unlikely to change without further pressure of government policy initiatives. Framing people at work as deserving of skill development will entail initiatives across the levels of community, economic and business development in order to develop a culture of accommodating both individual and organisational values. Maybe Rove will do it. Such a culture only becomes dominant once it has been embedded in organisational practice. At every level, from shareholder and management commitment to organisational philosophy and strategy, human resource management policies, and supporting organisational structures, management and team practices, individual behaviours. See, I don't want much change. The practice of HRM is in a difficult space, often lacking real power within organisational management, but also mistrusted by employees. Canadian academic Fennec observed that HRM does not have much power within organisational hierarchy and that practitioners may end up completely marginalised if they challenge core ideologies and practices. HRM has long been caught between a desire to serve individuals and serving organisational dominance. HRM practitioners generally need to decide whether they are merely doing a job as agents of management in the organisation, or whether they are exercising a broader perspective and social conscience in free and frank advice to the organisation. Do HRD practitioners think long-term and strategically about human development and balance this with short-term drivers? If HRD and HRM practitioners do not do this as part of their role for organisations, then who will? So, we're nearly there. <laughs> I want to conclude my academic perambulation by discussing a piece of work exploring different disciplinary perspectives on skill. 
This built on discussions I had with colleagues at Oxford University, um, the Centre for Skills, Knowledge and Organisation Performance, economist Professor Ken Mayhew, education, training and skills Professor Ewart Keep, and vocational education professor Susan James Reilly. And a big thank you to them for their collegiality over a long number of years. In any setting, one's disciplinary training or perspective guides the type of questions you ask, the methodologies you choose, the assumptions you do and don't make. It creates your blind spots. I'm a firm advocate of approaching an issue or phenomenon from a number of different perspectives or angles, as this can expand and challenge the way we frame things. So a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary pursuit. In this chapter uh, showing on the slide, I focused on skill, not only because I was asked to, <laughs> but also because it is a ubiquitous term, but it's not always commonly understood. Our understanding of skill varies, often as a reflection of our disciplinary interests. In the chapter, I used three cross-disciplinary lenses to examine varying views of skill, its meaning, its acquisition, its utilisation, its recognition, and its impact. These lenses, political economy of skill, skill as an organisational resource, and learning theory, enabled an exploration of economic, political science, sociology, industrial relations, human resource management, organisation studies, education and psychology perspectives. I found that in this range of disciplinary perspectives, there were many overlaps, but also there were four key areas of difference that emerged. There were differences in level of focus, on skill. Some disciplines focused at national level, some at organisational, some at individual, some focused on policy, some on the personal. There were differences in where disciplines regarded the location of skill. Some saw it being in the person, some saw it being in the job, and some saw it as a social construction. There were differences in skill definitions technical or behavioural or cognitive. And finally, there were differences in the type of variable that skill was, um, was seen as, dependent, independent, mediator or outcome. As a result, each disciplinary perspective reveals and explores only part of the full picture of skill. The best way to demonstrate the impact of different disciplinary perspectives on skill is through a brief example. The scenario I'll examine is unpaid graduate internships, something close to the heart of universities. One of the challenges facing government skills policy is that transition from education to employment. In the case of tertiary education in the United Kingdom in the 2010s, when employers cut graduate positions, one consequence was an increase in university graduates taking on unpaid internships in order to develop relevant work experience. In the worst cases, graduates occupied a series of unpaid internships in the hope of ultimately securing a paid job. Different disciplines would apply their own methodologies to address their own perspectives in analysing this. So a political economy perspective on a political economy of skill perspective on unpaid internships might seek to explore the short and long-term impact of these employer initiatives on firms, on the labour market generally, and on graduates, and the relationship or compatibility of these actions with a range of government policy. From an economic perspective, Analysis might address whether internships facilitate entry to the labour market and ask whether the costs and benefits of internships are borne appropriately and what are the knock-on effects to other positions and to the graduate labour market. A political science analysis may question how unpaid internships relate to existing skill formation policies and other government policies relating, for example, to welfare a sociological analysis 
may examine how internships construct skill and whether they perpetuate certain social structures that disadvantage some groups while privileging others. An industrial relations analysis would focus on issues of fair treatment of the intern and institutional or regulatory mechanisms to ensure fairness, and a legal one on the employment status of the intern and on how are they protected in the workplace and in the work relationship. From an HR perspective, analysis would focus on the costs and benefits to the organisation of internships. How does the intern contribute to organisational goals? How does one structure intern tasks and learning to optimise productivity? What does this do to the employer brand? What does this do to the retention, development and contribution of other employees? How does this fit the talent management strategy of the organisation? How does the organisation minimise legal and other risks associated with unpaid internships? From an education and psychology perspective, analysis might centre on what skill is developed in the internship. How is the learning structured and supported? How are graduates' existing skills transferred to the intern situation? So, what can one conclude about the implications of taking different disciplinary perspectives on skill? It's obvious from this example that to analyse from only one of these perspectives results in a limited view of the issue. The conse consequence of this for policy formulations is worrying as a narrow perspective on skill will result in policy that is at best ineffective or at worst harmful. In the case of unpaid internships, the temptation may be under pressure from employers to take only the HRM perspective. This then takes no account of compatibility with other skills related government policies or of the immediate and longer term impacts on students or other workers, nor any concern for the labour market as a whole. Alternatively, even when taking a broader political economy perspective, the resulting policy may lack an appreciation of how internships are implemented in organisations and how skill development can be enhanced or inhibited by internship arrangements. The full picture requires an appreciation of multiple disciplinary perspectives. Examining skill from multiple perspectives is a challenging but important task in order to increase our understanding develop effective policy and positively influence individual and societal well-being. Which brings me back to the university, and we're very nearly there. I have been lucky to have been involved in supervision teams across a wide variety of disciplines. So I want to give a big thank you to the inspiring PhD and master's students and co-supervisors I have had the privilege of working with, many of whom I can see here. A big thanks also to all my colleagues in the Wellington School of Business and Government, and especially in the Human Resource Management and Employment Relations Group and the Centre for Labour, Employment and Work. And also to colleagues across the university. It's wonderful to have the freedom and the opportunity to work with people from so many disciplines and backgrounds. I have had classicists present on institutions in the ancient world to my institution and organisations class. Uh, I've done HRM stuff for architecture. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity that universities offer. The university is the home of scholarship and learning. Individually, our disciplines are interesting and impactful. How we frame things, the methods we use, the assumptions made, the questions we do and don't ask, are important. Collectively, different disciplinary perspectives can yield powerful, relevant insights. So, I will finish by noting that there has recently been consultation led by MB, the Ministry of Business, <coughs> Innovation and Employment, on a legislative response to modern slavery and worker exploitation. I started with slavery and I will finish with it. Globally, the fastest growing crime 
is not drugs and weapons dealing or cyber fraud, it is modern slavery. Slavery frames people, predominantly children, young women and young men, as commodities to be traded or used till broken, things with no rights, freedoms or opportunities. It is not just the preserve of poorer nations, it happens in developed nations like our own. It features across industries and throughout supply chains. How we frame people at work is important and will always remain so, institutionally, organisationally and individually. At the university, how we respond to the challenges of our time through the collective power of our many disciplinary perspectives is our freedom and our responsibility. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Tēnā tātou katoa, e mihi ana ki nā tangata whenua o tēne rohe. E nā pō toko manoa, John Allen, ko tō ko Jennifer Windsor, ko Rawinia Higgins, ko Wendy Allen, tēnā, sorry, Wendy Lana, tēnā koto. E nā manuhiri, e nā aropa, o te rā tātou katoa, hua, Kua hui hui mai nei, no mai, hari mai, ki te heringa waka. For those who do not know me, my name is Mark Hickford, and I am the Pro Vice Chancellor of Government, Law and Business here at Te Heringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. It is my distinct privilege to appear before you now to propose a vote of thanks for our colleague, Ahorangi Jane Bryson. On this evening, we celebrate Jane and give thanks for a marvellous inaugural lecture. My greetings also to Gordon Anderson, Jane's partner in life, and to all family and friends present here this evening. I had thought I should also note that colleagues such as Richard Hill and others were meant to be in attendance here tonight, so if you are present, uh, my greetings to you also. It is wonderful to see everyone here tonight. This evening, in an inaugural entitled Framing People at Work, Autonomous Skilled Individual, or Compliant Cog in a Machine, or perhaps Compliant Clog, we have been honoured to hear Jane Bryson traverse central themes in her illustrious career as an academic. Professor Jane Bryson offers an approach to conceptions of work and the manifold futures of work, to skill, and to organisational change that is captivatingly and deliberately open to diverse disciplinary approaches. This, to me, typifies her scholarly interventions throughout an accomplished and illustrious career. As we have discerned this evening, Jane Bryson exhorts a multidisciplinary approach, stance, with se several perspectives and methodologies being deployed whether one is considering different notions of what it is to have skills and skillfulness in domains of work, or whether one is looking at shifting systemic approaches across time, from pluralistically orientated industrial relations to rather more unitrist human resources management in workplace administration. To use her words in an earlier published chapter from 2017, New Zealand, she has contended, witnessed a shift during the 1980s and into the subsequent decade from administering industrial awards to managing employer risk and organisational image. You heard her utter those words in this very lecture this evening. Jane Bryson also said in that chapter, the unitary perspective rests on an organisational logic of a unified authority and loyalty structure which legitimates managerial authority conflict is seen as unnecessary, and all workers should contribute to organisational goals under management direction. <coughs> Managers deal directly with staff 
in order to inspire loyalty and build a unified culture. In charting these latter shifts, for instance, Jane Bryson has explored the ways in which a unitarist orientation in human resource management tends to be transactional and much more individualized, with transgressions or conflicts seen as reducible to particular individual pathologies. She makes us reflect on neglected or perhaps otherwise forgotten aspects of that not too distant past and endeavors to ensure that we continue to contemplate other possibilities around framing the notion of work and relations in the workplace and to each other. Having had the personal pleasure of looking across her preceding work as I prepared to listen to her lecture this evening, I have noted this very openness to diverse disciplinary methods is an enduring feature of her own research. Thus we heard her note in her lecture this evening how the formal systems and processes, the business model strategy, the workplace practices, the culture all convey how workers are framed in that organization. As she set out back in 2008, when she approaches conceptions of culture, she exhorts those in the discipline of human resources and management to view cases more dynamically, to appreciate that there are multiple views in and of organizations, and she urges an earnest attempt to pursue complexities. In her own oeuvre, her own portfolio of research, she has said, and I quote, in the absence of full-scale participant observer studies which entail their own research shortcomings, we as organizational researchers remain the interpreters and purveyors of organizational snapshots. She gives rise to the ambition to continuously improve upon understanding and what is before us in contemplation. Secondly, and relatedly, a commitment to enabling flourishing human capabilities courses through her scholarship. In using conceptions of human capability as developed by Marcia Sen and Martha Nussbaum, amongst others, she draws on specialists in philosophy and econom economics and other disciplines to apply different angles of vision. Captivatingly, she talks about an aspiring shift, perhaps, from HRM, human resource management, to HCD, human capability development. It is a delight to be here and to have heard from such an accomplished scholar with such depth, imagination, and humanity in her approach. I cannot, however, depart the podium without paying special acknowledgement to Jane as a leader and a colleague. I am privileged to work with her in her capacity as Dean of Wellington School of Business and Government. I was personally delighted to be a colleague of hers when she became the Deputy Dean some years ago. I've had the pleasure of working with her when she was Associate Dean Research. And also I find her humane, undoubtedly calm, and able always to engage with colleagues as human beings. Jane, this university, your university, is so grateful, gladdened, and heartened to have you counted amongst its professoriate. And it has been a joy for me to offer this vote of thanks. Before I invite colleagues here to join us for refreshments on the mezzanine floor of this building, I ask that all of those present here this evening join with me in showing the customary mark of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you.